Beloved by Toni Morrison, audio by YQ, Chapter Ten. Out of sight of Mister's sight, away. Praise his name from the smiling boss of roosters. Paul D began to tremble, not all at once, and not so anyone could tell. When he turned his head, aiming for a last look at brother. Turned it as much as the rope that connected his neck to the axle of a buckboard allowed, and later on, when they fastened the iron around his ankles and clamped the wrists as well, there was no outward sign of trembling at all. Nor eighteen days after that, when he saw the ditches, the one thousand feet of earth, five feet deep, five feet wide, into which wooden boxes had been fitted. A door of bars that you could lift on hinges, like a cage, opened into three walls and a roof of scrap lumber and red dirt. Two feet of it over his head, three feet of open trench in front of him, with anything that crawled or scurried, welcome to share that grave calling as self quarters. And there were forty-five more. He was sent there after trying to kill brandy wine. The man school teacher told him to. Brandy wine was leading him. In a coffle with ten others, through Kentucky into Virginia, he didn't know exactly what prompted him to try, other than Halley, Sixel, Paulet, Pauleff, and Mister. But the trembling was fixed by the time he knew it was there. Still, no one else knew it, because it began inside, a flutter of a kind in the chest, then the shoulder blades. It felt like rippling. Gentle at first, and then wild, as though the further south they led him, the more his blood, frozen like an ice pond for twenty years, began thawing, breaking into pieces that, once melted, had no choice but to swirl and eddy. Sometimes it was in his leg, then again it moved to the base of his spine. By the time they unhitched him from the wagon, and he saw nothing but dogs and two shacks in a world of sizzling grass, the roiling blood was shaking him to and fro. But no one could tell. The wrists he held out for the bracelet that evening were steady as were the legs he stood on when chains were attached to the leg irons. But when they shoved him into the box and dropped the cage door down, his hands quit taking instruction. On their own, they traveled. Nothing could stop them or get their attention. They would not hold his penis to urinate or a spoon to scoop lumps of lima beans into his mouth. The miracle of their obedience came with the hammer at dawn. All forty-six men woke to a rifle shot. All forty-six. Three white men walked along the trench, unlocking the doors one by one. No one stepped through. When the last lock was opened, the three returned and lifted the bars one by one, and one by one the black men emerged promptly and without the poke of rifle butt. If they had been there more than a day, promptly with the butt. If like Paul D, they had just arrived. When all forty-six were standing in a line in the trench. Another rifle shot signaled the climb out and up to the ground above, where one thousand feet of the best hand-forged chain in Georgia stretched. Each man bent and waited. The first man picked up the end and threaded it through the loop on his leg iron. He stood up then and, shuffling a little, brought the chain tip to the next prisoner, who did likewise. As the chain was passed on and each man stood in the other's place, the line of men turned around, facing the boxes they had come out of. Not one spoke to the other, at least not with words. The eyes had to tell what there was to tell. Help me this morning. It's bad. I'm a make it new man. Steady now, steady. Chain up completed. They knelt down. The dew, more likely than not, was missed by then. Heavy sometimes, and if the dogs were quiet and just breathing, you could hear doves. Kneeling in the mist, they waited for the whim of a guard, or two, or three.
or maybe all of them wanted it, wanted it from one prisoner in particular, or none, or all. Breakfast? Want some breakfast, nigger? Yes, sir. Hungry, nigger? Yes, sir. Here you go. Occasionally, a kneeling man chose gunshot in his head as the price, maybe of taking a bit of foreskin with him to Jesus. Paul D did not know that then. He was looking at his palsied hands, smelling the guard, listening to his soft grunt, so like the doves, as he stood before the man kneeling in mist on his right. Convinced he was next, Paul D wretched, vomiting up nothing at all. An observing guard smashed his shoulder with the rifle, and the engaged one decided to skip the new man for the time being, lest his pants and shoes got soiled by nigger puke. Ha! It was the first sound. Other than yes, sir, a black man was allowed to speak each morning, and the lead chain gave it everything he had. Hi! It was never clear to Paul D how he knew when to shout that mercy. They called him High Man, and Paul D thought at first the guards told him when to give the signal that let the prisoners rise up off their knees and dance two step to the music of hand forged iron. Later he doubted it. He believed to this day that the high at dawn and the ho when evening came were the responsibility High Man assumed because he alone knew what was enough, what was too much. When things were over. When the time had come, they chain danced over the fields, through the woods to a trail that ended in the astonishing beauty of feldspar, and there Paul D's hands disobeyed the furious rippling of his blood and paid attention. With a sledge hammer in his hands and high man's lead, the man got through. They sang it out and beat it up, garbling the words so they could not be understood. Tricking the words so their syllables yielded up other meanings, they sang the woman they knew, the children they had been, the animals they had tamed themselves or seen others tame. They sang of bosses and masters and misses, of mules and dogs and the shamelessness of life. They sang lovingly of graveyards and sisters long gone, of pork in the woods, meal in the pan, fish on the line. Cane, ring, and rocking chairs, and they beat the women for having known them, and no more, no more. The children for having been them, but never again. They killed a boss so often and so completely they had to bring him back to life to pulp him one more time. Tasting hot meal cake among pine trees, they beat it away. Singing love songs to Mister Death, they smashed his head. More than the rest, they killed the flirt whom folks called life for leading them on, making them think the next sunrise would be worth it, that another stroke of time would do it at last. Only when she was dead would they be safe. The successful ones, the ones who had been there enough years to have maimed, mutilated, maybe even buried her, kept watch over the others. Who were still in her cock-teasing hug, caring and looking forward, remembering and looking back, they were the ones whose eyes said, "Help me, bad," or "Look out," meaning this might be the day I bay or eat my own mess or run, and it was this last that had to be guarded against. For if one pitched and ran, all, all forty-six would be yanked by the chain that bound them. And no telling who or how many would be killed. A man could risk his own life, but not his brother's. So the eye said, "Steady now, and hand by me." Eighty-six days and done. Life was dead. Paul D beat her butt all day, every day, till there was not a whimper in her. Eighty-six days, and his hands were still. Waiting serenely each rat rustling night for high at dawn and the eager clench on the hammer's shaft, life rolled over dead, or so he thought. It rained. Snakes came down from shore leaf pine and hemlock. It rained. Cypress, yellow poplar, ash and palmetto 
drooped under five days of rain without wind. By the eighth day, the doves were nowhere in sight. By the ninth, even the salamanders were gone. Dogs laid their ears down and stared over their paws. The men could not work. Chain up was slow. Breakfast abandoned. The two-step became a slow drag over soupy grass and unreliable earth. It was decided to lock everybody down in the boxes till it either stopped or lightened up, so a white man could walk. Damn it! Without flooding his gun, and the dogs would quit shivering. The chain was threaded through forty-six loops of the best hand-forged iron in Georgia. It rained. In the boxes, the men heard the water rise in the trench and looked out for cottonmouth. They squatted in muddy water, slept above it, peed in it. Paddy thought he was screaming. His mouth was open, and there was this loud throat-splitting sound. But it may have been somebody else. Then he thought he was crying. Something was running down his cheeks. He lifted his hands to wipe away the tears and saw dark brown slime. Above him, rivulets of mud slid through the boards of the roof. Then it came down. He thought, "Gonna crush me, like a tick bug." It happened so quick he had no time to ponder. Somebody yanked the chain once hard enough to cross his legs and throw him into the mud. He never figured out how he knew how anybody did, but he did know he did, and he took both hands and yanked the length of chain at his left, so the next man would know too. The water was above his ankles. Flowing over the wooden plank he slept on, and then it wasn't water any more. The ditch was caving in, and mud oozed under and through the bars. They waited, each and every one of the forty-six, not screaming, although some of them must have fought like the devil not to. The mud was up to his thighs, and he held on to the bars. Then it came another yank from the left this time. And less forceful than the first because of the mud it passed through. It started like the chain up, but the difference was the power of the chain. One by one, from high men back on down the line, they dove down through the mud under the bars, blind, groping. Some had sense enough to wrap their heads in their shirts, cover their faces with rags, put on their shoes. Others just plunged. Simply ducked down and pushed out, fighting up, reaching for air. Some lost direction, and their neighbors, feeling the confused pull of the chain, snatched them around. For one lost, all lost. The chain that held them would save all or none, and high men was the delivery. They talked through that chain like Sam Morse and Great God. They all came up, like the unshriven dead. Zombies on the loose, holding the chains in their hands. They trusted the rain and the dark. Yes, but mostly high men and each other. Past the sheds where the dogs lay in deep depression, past the two guard shacks, past the stable of sleeping horses, past the hands whose bills were bolted into their feathers. They waited. The moon did not help because it wasn't there. The field was a marsh. The track a troll. All Georgia seemed to be sliding, melting away. Moss wiped their faces as they fought the live oak branches that blocked their way. Georgia took up all of Alabama and Mississippi then, so there was no state line to cross, and it wouldn't have mattered anyway. If they had known about it, they would have avoided not only Alfred and the beautiful feldspar. But Savannah too, and headed for the sea islands on the river that slid down from the Blue Ridge Mountains. But they didn't know. Daylight came, and they huddled in a copse of redbud trees. Night came, and they scrambled up to higher ground, praying the rain would go on shielding them and keeping them folks at home. They were hoping for a shack, solitary, some distance from its big house. Where a slave might be making rope or beating potatoes at the grate, what they found was a camp of sick Cherokee for whom a rose was named. Decimated but stubborn, they were among those who chose a fugitive life rather than Oklahoma. 
The illness that swept them now was reminiscent of the one that had killed half their number two hundred years earlier. In between that calamity and this, they had visited George the Third in London, published a newspaper, made baskets, led Oglethorpe through forests, helped Andrew Jackson fight Creek, cooked maize, drawn up a constitution, petitioned the King of Spain. Been experimented on by Dartmouth, established asylums, wrote their language, resisted settlers, shot bear, and translated scripture, all to no avail. The forced moved to the Arkansas River, insisted upon by the same president they fought for against the Creek, destroyed another quarter of their already shattered number. That was it, they thought, and removed themselves from those Cherokee who signed the treaty. In order to retire into the forest and await the end of the world, the disease they suffered now was a mere inconvenience compared to the devastation they remembered. Still, they protected each other as best they could. The healthy were sent some miles away; the sick stayed behind with the dead to survive or join them. The prisoners from Alfred, Georgia, sat down in semicircle near the encampment. No one came, and still they sat. Hours passed, and the rain turned soft. Finally, a woman stuck her head out of her house. Night came, and nothing happened. At dawn, two men with barnacles covering their beautiful skin approached them. No one spoke for a moment. Then High Man raised his hand. The Cherokee saw the chains and went away. When they returned, each carried a handful of small axes. Two children followed with a pot of mush, cooling and th- thinning the rain. Buffalo man, they called them, and talked slowly to the prisoners, scooping mush and tapping away all their chains. Nobody from the box in Alfred, Georgia, cared about the illness the Cherokee warned them about, so they stayed, all forty-six, resting. Planning their next move, Paul D had no idea of what to do and knew less than anybody. It seemed, he heard his co-convicts talking knowledgeably of rivers and states, towns and territories. Heard a Cherokee man describe the beginning of the world and its end. Listened to tales of other buffalo men they knew, three of whom were in the healthy camp a few miles away. High men wanted to join them. Others wanted to join them. Some wanted to leave. Some to stay on. Weeks later, Paul D was the only buffalo man left, without a plan. All he could think of was tracking dogs. Although High Man said the rain they left in gave them no chance of success, alone the last man was Buffalo Hair among the ailing Cherokee. Paul D finally woke up and, admitting his ignorance, asked how he might get north. Free North, magical North, welcoming, benevolent North. The Cherokee smiled and looked around. The flood rains of a month ago had turned everything to steam and blossoms. That way, he said, pointing. Follow the tree flowers, he said. Only the tree flowers. As they go, you go. You will be where you want to be when they are gone. So he raced from dogwood to blossoming peach. When they thinned out, he headed for the cherry blossoms, the magnolia, chinaberry, pecan, walnut, and prickly pear. At last, he reached a field of apple trees whose flowers were just becoming tiny knots of fruits. Spring sauntered north, but he had to run like hell to keep it as his traveling companion. From February to July, he was on the lookout for blossoms. When he lost them and found himself without so much as a petal to guide him, he paused, climbed a tree on a hillock, and scanned the horizon for a flash of pink or white in the leaf world that surrounded him. He did not touch them or stop to smell. He merely followed in their wake, a dark, ragged figure guided by the blossoming plums. The apple field turned out to be Delaware, where the Weaver Lady lived. He snapped him up as soon as he finished the sausage he fed him, and he crawled into her bed crying. 
He passed him off as her nephew from Syracuse simply by calling him that nephew's name. Eighteen months, and he was looking out again for blossoms. Only this time, he did the looking on the dray. It was some time before he could put Alfred, Georgia, Sixel, school teacher, Hallie, his brothers, Sethy, Mister, the taste of iron, the sight of butter, the smell of hickory, notebook paper, one by one, into the tobacco tin lodged in his chest. By the time he got to one twenty-four. Nothing in this world could pry it open.